Abin Resources Limited is a gold exploration company with significant projects in British Columbia and the Yukon. Trading on the TSX Venture Exchange, symbol ABN, and the OTCQB, symbol ABNAF. Surrounded by world-class gold deposits and mines, Avon's 23,000 hectares Forest Kerr Gold Project is located in the heart of the Golden Triangle in northwestern BC. For more information, visit us at avonresources.com. You're listening to HowStreet.com Radio, available online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. Welcome to HowStreet.com Radio, the online source for market opinions. Here is Jim Goddard. My guest is Ted Dixon, CEO and co-founder of InkResearch.ca. He invented the Inc. Canadian Insider Index, which is used by the Horizons Canadian Insider Index ETF, a 2017 and 2018 fund data Fun Grade A Plus Award winner, his website, CanadianInsider.com. Welcome back to the show, Ted. Thanks for having me back, Jim. Ted, the U.S. Fed uh, had its latest meeting today. What did they tell us about interest rates, and how does that affect gold? Well, gold was the big mover today on seemingly kind of nonchalant statements by the Fed saying, well, we're going to keep interest rates the same, and we think... Everything is sort of on the right track, but gold was the only real asset that gained today, aside from bonds, on the Fed news. So, so why was that? Well, the uh, Federal Reserve has uh, basically come out and said that they're going to reassess their inflation outlook, and and that has a, a lot of implications for the market uh, in a way to get to their 2% target sustainably. Now, so gold investors took that as, well, uh, that means we may have more inflation. We better buy some gold. But then we saw the bond market say, oh, we don't believe you. And the bond market actually, the yields went down. And in fact, I saw a tweet from a Bloomberg reporter that the 30-year bond was at its lowest yield in in over five years and the bond market is saying no we don't believe you're going to make your inflation targets we, we in fact we think the chance of you making your inflation target is almost zero so you've got a case of okay either we're going to have more inflation or we're going to have a lot less inflation and gold investors were saying you know i can take either of those now it has a big implications I think for the type of gold stocks you might want to buy if you're buying if you're into buying gold stocks. In fact, it really does matter if you have inflation versus deflation. But in terms of gold itself, you kind of like what it saw today, and it was the big winner. And and I think that that's probably the right response from the gold market. Uh, sure, you know, could could, could we have could the the big enemy of gold, uh, ironically, is Goldilocks, right? Where uh, everything is great. Interest rates are low, but you know the economy is moving, booming or mini booming, sort of not too hot, not too cold. Who needs gold in that case? You just buy, you know, tech stocks or whatever hot area of the economy you think you can make some money in. But you know things are okay, and you don't really feel you need to, uh, to head your position with gold. So Goldilocks is gold's you know enemy. But really, market investors today, after hearing the Fed. They're not buying the Goldilocks story. Certainly the bond market is not buying it. And we'll have to see if the gloom in term on inflation that the bond market is forecasting, uh, you know, comes to unfold. Because if it does, and that has big implications, again, not only for the type of gold stocks you'd buy, but it all has big implications for the Canadian market and, and every uh, set of asset classes. So we'll have to see how it plays out. But it was a, it was a very uh, interesting day, uh, certainly what we heard from the Fed and has big implications for the Canadian market, uh, you know, starting with the gold, the gold zone where, you know, bravo uh, for the gold group. Finally, you know, I think this is a part of the market where you're going to see some action. You know, this is where the action is uh, going to be, Jim. And this is going to be, a, this is going to be hard for a lot of non-Canadian, like, uh, really non-Canadian, but those investors who haven't played the Canadian resource market. I know you've got a lot of listeners from Europe, in the United States who have played it, but the vast majority of investors around the world, this is all a foreign kind of uh, zone to them, and, and that's 
finally going to work in the favor of the long-time gold investors and, and people who've been keeping the faith for the last number of years because this is where the action's going to be. And, you know, there's going to be winners and losers depending on how this deflation and inflation uh, situation works out. Like, for example, um, you know, we have a, a situation in the market right now where you've got a, a low-cost gold producer, uh, Kirkland Lake Gold, is trying to buy a high-cost producer, Detour Gold. And I believe that 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 uh, uh, decision hasn't been made yet by the shareholders of uh, of the of the of the. Oh no! Wait, wait, I I take that back. It looks like uh, as of yesterday, Kirkland Lake. Gold, I'm just reading here, uh, Kirkland Lake Gold shareholders overwhelmingly approved Detour Gold acquisition. Okay, so that's that's news. And so what that means to me is that if uh, this deal does go through, and there may still be some some uh, I's and T's that have to be uh, uh, crossed for it to happen, if it does go through, the uh, the chances of success, for that acquisition to work would be under a deflationary environment because that would help keep the cost of uh, the high-cost producer de- uh, detour lake down. So, uh, you know, and so that's a general bit of a generalization. Uh, I'm not a gold analyst, so I, you know, I, that's not to uh, make a forecast on the the chances of this uh, deal going through or what the mechanics are would be required to, to make it successful. But just in general, you know, as a starting point of an investor, you know, you, it does matter uh, whether you have an inflation or a deflation environment. If if inflation does pick up and uh, right now, the signs so far in 2020 are, are are not that way. In fact, inflation expectations are going quickly in reverse. But if inflation were to reverse later in the year, then that would be problematic for uh, high-cost gold producers because then you'd have cost of inputs going up, and it would make it even more challenging to to, br- to break even, even 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 if uh, the gold price is going up because the gold price would have to outstrip the, you know, all the costs. So. So in a uh, in a uh, uh, high inflation environment, you want a lower cost producers. So, but we'll have to see how that's going to play out. I think that's a big question mark. We wrote about this in our uh, gold uh, top twenty January report, which is available to Canadian Insider Club uh, members on the CanadianInsider dot com site and increase their subscribers. And we address this very question. So that'll be something you know certainly for. Those in the gold market that are active, it'll give them something to look at and something certainly to potentially trade. So, you know, we could be in for some exciting times here in, in, in the gold market and the gold stock, uh, gold stock area. And, you know, I mean, I mean, it's great. I mean, these questions now are relevant. Uh, you know, what, what gold stocks should you buy as opposed to why would I want to buy gold stocks? You know, and, and that was the, that was, that's been sort of the thinking of, uh, Global investors, you know, up since 2012, but uh, that's quickly changing, and well, you know, we'll just have to see how rapidly other investors from around the world decide they want to get in on the action. You know, uh, we'll we'll have to see. But uh, it was a, it was a good news day for the gold market. Not so much though for the broad stock market today after uh, hearing what uh, Jerome Powell had to say. We'll have more with Ted Dixon right after this. Engineer Gold Mines is focused on the exploration and development of the historic high-grade Engineer Gold Mine situated 32 kilometers southwest of Atlin, British Columbia. Engineer Gold Mines is fully permitted for surface and underground exploration with the 2019 drill program now underway. Engineer Gold Mines Limited trades on the TSX Venture Exchange, symbol EAU. For more information, please visit us at engineergoldmines.com. Cypress Development Corp. is developing a world-class lithium resource in the heart of Clayton Valley, Nevada. The size of the resource makes the Clayton Valley project a premier asset with the potential to impact the future of lithium supply. Cypress Development Corp. trades on the TSX Venture Exchange, symbol CYP, the OTCQB, symbol CYDVF, and on Frankfurt, symbol C1Z1. For more information, please visit our website, cypressdevelopmentcorp.com. Welcome back. We're speaking with Ted Dixon. Today, President Trump signed the USMCA, the new free trade deal, leaving Canada as the lone holdout. Is Canada expected to sign it without any problems? 
Well, I think uh, Canada was waiting for the Americans. I mean, they put Canada's name at the end of the agreement. So I guess we should be the last ones to sign, right, Jim, if, if it's the U.S.-Mexico-Canada agreement. So here we are. So it made a lot of sense for Canada to wait. There was a lot of a political uncertainty with respect to what was going to happen in the United States. And in Canada, we'll get the we'll get it through Parliament because both the Liberals and the Conservatives support it. And it doesn't really matter what the NDP think about it. Uh, do you have any concerns about it? Or somebody said it's the same old deal, really. I, I don't think it's uh, I don't think it's a material development for for uh, Canadian investors, in in the sense of opening up a lot of new opportunities. It's 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 important for the auto sector. That's done, you know. So it it, it takes away a negative, a potential negative. Uh, so it's helpful. It's uh, it's positive, but you know, it's not uh, it's not sort of a, a something that's going to lead to a stampede of growth. It was just more or less the government had to do some firefighting on that, and they put out the fire. And now they can, uh, you know, hopefully rebuild the, the auto industry can rebuild its uh, its its momentum here uh, over the next year or so. Uh, but that'll be based off of global uh, global event, global economic developments and the ability of, uh, of course, individual manufacturers to swerve with the times. But uh, yeah, the ball is now back really into the court of the. The CEOs of the different auto companies to deal with a still challenging economic environment. The one good thing I would say about the auto uh, sector uh, for an investing standpoint is a lot of the bad news has been priced in. And of course, what you don't want to do is be buying stocks that are priced for perfection when there's a risk that that perfection trade may end. And that uh, uh, of course, on the other side, uh, just because stocks price in for bad news doesn't mean they could get priced in even more. But uh, at least, at least, uh, you know, the uh, the auto industry has gone through a lot of pain in terms of stock prices. So, you know, we uh, I'm just you know looking at uh, Linamar, for example. Uh, it's actually it's a Canadian uh, auto parts maker, but it's got operations in different parts of the world. You know, it's still trading above its 200-day moving average here, even after you know after today's close. It's well above its uh, its 52-week low. But look, you know, its valuations it's trading at a price to cash flow of 3.3 PE, 5.9. So you know, these are very, very low, relatively low value valuations. For example, you know, with a PE of 5.9, that compares to a market average of 20.3. So, you know. Uh, this is not, you know, valuations are not a market timing tool, but over the longer term, you know, usually uh, lower, you know, cheaper stocks tend to do better over time, you know, provided they can, you know, they're, they're, it's not a value trap and they're about to go bust. And uh, But, you know, generally uh, when you've got these uh, situations where bad news is baked in the cake, uh, you know, it's not a bad starting point to look at a potential investment opportunity. And I see, you know, at, at Linamar, we still have very good insider uh, commitment. Uh, there's still insider buying. I'm not recommending this stock. It's just, you know, something we talk, or talk, I'm talking about in relation to the trade deal. We have a sunny outlook on it, a sunny ink edge outlook on it that puts it in the top 10% of all stocks ranked. It's in the in Canadian Insider Index. So, uh, you know, it's, you know, for, for you know, for a long-term contrarian value type investor, you know, it's, it's something to potentially put on your radar screen as, and certainly, uh, a, a, something to look at in a broader portfolio context. So it's just the Canadian Insider Index. And, uh, you know, maybe it will have its uh, day if, uh, if the global economy can, can show any signs of reacceleration here, uh, coming out of the, the, uh, the problems we're having with the, the Wuhan, uh, 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 coronavirus. And uh, after all these all this trade flap between China and the U.S., if we can start to get some momentum later in the year, then the auto sector is probably poised to, to for rebound because so much bad news is already in the price. We'll have more with Ted Dixon right after this.
Media recognition from Bloomberg, Reuters, Recycling Trade Publications, patented process for 100% recovery of critical metals, including cobalt, lithium, nickel, manganese, aluminum. American Manganese is focused on recycling lithium-ion batteries for electric vehicles. American Manganese trades on the TSX Venture, AMY, the US, AMYZF, and Frankfurt 2AM. For more information, visit AmericanManganeseInc.com or phone me, Larry Ray, at 778-574-4444. Don't miss out. Stay informed. Receive the HowStreet.com weekly recap with thought-provoking podcasts, radio, and articles delivered to your inbox. Sign up for the HowStreet.com weekly recap on our homepage at HowStreet.com. Welcome back. We're speaking with Ted Dixon. Ted, $1.5 trillion. Why is that number interesting? Well, that was the number that Jerome Powell uh, said t- today in answer to a question about what will be enough, uh, what will be enough on your balance sheet in terms of uh, bank reserves where you know you'll be happy. And he said basically, well, 1.5 trillion is the minimum, minimum. So they want to see uh, uh, bank reserves on their on their balance sheet at a minimum of 1.5 trillion. And uh, you know, it got me thinking. Well, why is that? And uh, he then, you know, he went on to say, now, that, that's the minimum. So he made it very clear that's not was a target. That was the minimum. And that then they would expect these reserves to grow more or less like kind of organically on an as neat basis. And that got me thinking, hmm, so what is he saying here? Basically, 1.5 uh, trillion is the minimum. And, and it's kind of around there now. And as he mentions, it fluctuates. But he did leave the door open that, that, that those reserves could go up. So if, you know, if, if we're, if we're here a year from now and the, the and there's two, over two trillion dollars on the, on the balance sheet in reserves, he can say, well, that was the minimum. I didn't know it was the maximum. And what would, so what would drive the need, Jim, for more reserves? And part of it, part of the answer, I think, comes to the Uncle Sam's debt. You know, uh, a lot of, uh, when they do these uh, open market operations, they're called to uh, help facilitate the growth of these reserves. The Fed ends up buying treasury bills now. Well, who issues the treasury bills? Well, Uncle Sam. So, uh, you know, and, and in fact, they issue a lot of them to, so they can spend money. So really, uh, one interpretation of this $1.5 trillion is that, look, you know, uh, if there is a need to accumulate more reserves in the U.S. Uh, the U.S. banking system will be there for it if there is a need. Well, here's here's a prediction, Jim. There will be a need because the U.S. Treasury is going to keep spending lots of money, and so there will be a need. <laughs> there will be a, a need found to increase those reserves so that so that the central bank can keep buying those Treasury bills. So, you know, that's certainly one to watch. Uh, watch. I don't expect that the, the, this balance sheet is going to stall at $1.5 trillion. Not at all. Uh, it's going to get bigger and bigger. Uh, these uh, these sort of what they call technical operations, what they're trying to spin NOQE as, uh, these technical operations will live on in some form or another. And it will, they will continue to live on. So it'll be quite, it'll be quite interesting. And, but what's really going to be important for the Canadian market is going to be, uh, and this is not on very many, uh, radar screens, is this Federal Reserve Inflation Review. And he was asked a really great question in the press conference today. And that was, you know, what, 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 what would, what would happen to your monetary policy if you were, let's just say, let's just say, Jerome, that if you were to adopt a inflation averaging uh, target so that that inflation had to average two percent as opposed to hit two percent. Would that change monetary policy? And first of all, he didn't dismiss the idea, which for any government bureaucrat not to dismiss an idea means they're thinking about it. If not, if not, the decision's already been made to do it because he had every opportunity to shut that down and he didn't. And secondly, he answered, "Oh yes." Yeah, it probably would. You know, we're not there today, so it's not impacting us today. We're happy with where we are today because everything's fine, you know. <laughs> but uh, but if we were to change this policy, um, yeah, you know, we would have to adjust our uh, – I don't have the exact words because I uh, didn't have time to – the transcript wasn't uh, published by the time we went on air here. 
but uh, you know, he seemed to indicate that yes, there would be a you know a, a different policy response. So that is huge for the Canadian market because it would mean that they would then have the cover to actively push up inflation expectations. And now, for example, the Inc. Canadian Cider Index, which is a mid-cap oriented index, it has over a you know seventy percent correlation with changing inflation expectations. So if we, you know, we've had a bit of a setback here uh, earlier in the year. Uh, in mid-cap Canadian stocks, I, you know, in terms of what I expected, well, you just have to look at what's happened to inflation expectations. They've fallen. They, the, the highest point uh, in 2020 for inflation expectations in the U.S. was on the first day of the year, first trading day of the year, and they've gone down ever since. So that gives you a, a, a kind of an idea of some of the headwinds facing sort of mid-cap Canadian stocks and smaller Canadian stocks. And the Fed, if the Fed though finally makes it clear that they are going to do what it takes to get an average inflation rate of 2%. It's a whole different ballgame, and that could happen before the end of the second half of the year. So really, you know, in these sort of gloomy sell-offs, which we could have, now, you know, it's not a bad time to maybe start hedging your bets a little bit and, and on weakness, sort of you know, getting exposure to the Canadian economy, Canadian stock market, sorry, uh, a little bit at a time, uh, because look, uh, yeah, we don't know how long the, this uh, Wuhan virus is going to continue. The SARS um, you know, oil, for example, uh, we're in a period right now where it could be putting in sort of, you know, a seasonal low, Robbie Burns Day low, uh, but uh, it, what happened when, you know, when, when SARS hit, uh, it wasn't a low in January. It kept the uh, oil kept struggling for months, and you know, so we could be headed for that situation uh, with the Wuhan virus. We don't know, uh, but you know, look, if China, if everyone goes back to to work uh, in early February, and 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 the virus starts to, it, it, you know, starts to sort of move off the radar screens of people, then uh, you know, we could get a rebound in, in crude, and we could be off to the races. So. Uh, you just have to be prepared for different uh, outcomes here, and I think you know it's inflation versus deflation. We're going to get one or the other, uh, and it's going to make a big difference, Jim, in terms of where you want to be in the market, whether it's the broad market, your your exposure to Canadian stocks in general. As you get more inflation, you want more Canadian stocks, and in the gold s- uh, sector. Uh, if you get more inflation, you want to have those uh, low-cost producers uh, that uh, you know can can really take advantage of a rising gold price and not get squeezed on the cost side. You just uh, pointed out the U.S. yield curve has re-inverted, and uh, I know if you're a pilot, unless you fly stunt planes or a fighter pilot, inversion's never a good thing. Well, we're living in interesting times, uh, you know, as Bob Hoy always says. And, you know, for for a year or two, we were on this, you know, yield curve inversion watch where, you know, everyone was waiting for the yield curve to invert. Uh, and, uh, you know, and it did last year in the U.S. But then it, then it steepened again. And then we had the big, you know, discussion. Oh, well, that means a recession is definitely coming. And because once it steepens, then that's the recession signal. Okay. You know, leave that as it is. But now it's reinverted again. You know, as it, it, you know, looking at the, at the overnight versus like the ten year. Now the two year versus ten year hasn't reinverted. And but the, the fact of the matter is, it's starting to reinvert again, and uh, reinvert again, right? So like that, that's redundant. You know, so uh, but that's what's happening. You know, you've got this reinversion, and how many times is it going to reinvert? Right? Uh, we, we're just living in these kind of amazing you know uh, times where uh, the markets are s- been so distorted by central bank action that you just got to scratch your head and, and sit back and go what is going on here it is you know you, there is no price discovery uh, that uh, in the bond market i think that is really tell- worth much because of all the interference you've had from central banks you know so you're you know, I hear it all the time. Well, just look at the bond market. The bond market never lies. Uh, I'm sorry, I don't buy that anymore because you've got uh, the ECB and you've got the BOJ uh, messing around with it still. You have the Fed and it's buying bills now. So, uh, you know, I think the bond market has zero integrity. The bond market lies all the time. Look at the gold market. Look at what gold's telling you. 
So, Ted, does that mean the dangers of a recession as predicted by inverted yield curves is over, or has that uh, been overplayed? To be honest with you, based off of the interference of central banks in the bond market, I really don't know what to make of this inversion again, except to say that it's not a healthy state of development, a state of affairs. The bond market is behaving very weird. It's very weird. We live in weird economic times. So I would be very careful about what's going on in the bond market. But, you know, I'm not a bond market expert. Maybe uh, there are some out there who can explain everything that's going on, what it means. Uh, you know, certainly low yields are, are going to be good for gold stocks, but they'll, they, they, they have been good for technology stocks. Will that continue to be the case? I don't know. You know, uh, when you've got an, a re-inversion going on, I don't know. You know, uh, what is that telling us, Jim? It, 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 it doesn't seem good. And so at some time, to- at some point, you got to go with your kind of gut feel and common sense. And this isn't a normal type of behavior in the market. So, but look, you know, maybe you'll find a guest who can explain it all. And, uh, then I'll be happy to, you know, to take, <laughs> take notes and, and go, oh, okay, now I get it. But, uh, uh it, it's, it's concerning uh, for the medium term, but look, as investors, we just got to make the, the the best of the cards that we are dealt. And uh, you know, a year ago or so, I, I I may not have been as constructive on the gold market. Uh, when I mean gold market, I mean gold gold stocks uh, for a number of reasons, uh, and many relating to governance issues of gold companies. But uh, Look, I, as we said earlier in the, in the show, I think it's going to be one area where the action is going to be. You know, we, we will see uh, unless uh, Goldilocks comes roaring back here. Ted, thank you so much for being on the show. Thanks very much, Jim. My guest has been Ted Dixon, CEO and co-founder of IncResearch.ca. If you have any questions for Ted, you can send them to info at HowStreet.com. Our YouTube channel is Talk Digital Network. Find us on Twitter at House Street. We're also on Facebook. I'm Jim Goddard. Thank you for listening. Comments made on HowStreet.com radio are an expression of opinion only and should not be construed in any matter whatsoever as recommendations to buy or sell any financial instrument at any time. Available online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. HowStreet.com Radio is a production of HowStreet Media Incorporated.